Hi, this is Doug Schrift with Senior Fitness Radio. Today, I'm so excited to bring on uh, Patrick Losasso. Patrick is a trainer and an internationally recognized authority on Parkinson's exercise. He consults with medical professionals and trainers, sharing his unique and evidence-based methods to improve health and function for people living with Parkinson's disease and other neurological conditions. I almost couldn't say that. Thanks, Patrick, for joining us. I really appreciate your time on uh, Senior Fitness Radio. Absolutely, Douglas. Thanks for having me. You've got a great thing going. I'm glad I can uh, participate. Absolutely. So um, uh, today's topic is is Parkinson's. Your specialty is Parkinson's exercise. So tell me a little bit about your past, your personal life, your um, how you got into this. (laughs) Um, I'm probably an example of someone who's changed. Is evidence that you change your career and end up doing something you don't really expect to do. I. uh, Actually, if you can see behind me, I've got a guitar on the wall. I actually graduated from DePaul oh, yeah. University's music school. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I was a music- musician for years, and I moved out to Los Angeles to uh, do some acting, and uh, I did a little bit of it. It was um, moderately successful, but then realized it was uh, not for me. And I, um, when I had first moved to L.A., I actually started um, the sport of boxing. I started um, training as a boxer and competing, and the guy I was training with was – kind of one of the trainers to the stars. And uh, he was out of town shooting a film and asked me to teach his classes. So it was the first time I actually ever worked as a trainer or a teacher, and I started teaching boxing. And I really found that I enjoyed it very much, and the people I worked with seemed to enjoy me working with them. So I just started studying um, physiology, and I got my trainer certificate, and I got my strength and conditioning specialist uh, certification, which is a training certificate that um, allows you to work with elite athletes and train them to excel at their sport. Um, so I started working as just a, a normal trainer, and I guess probably 11 years ago or so, I met a guy named Joe who had Parkinson's, and I was referred to him by um, a woman whose acupuncturist worked with her and saw the work that we did together and referred me to Joe. So that began my uh, began my journey into Parkinson's disease as an exercise specialist. I didn't know anything about the disease when I met Joe, uh, but I really, he was a really neat guy and I became very close to the family and I immersed myself in the study of the disease to see what I could do to make Joe's life better. And from my perspective as a strength and conditioning specialist, I basically treated the disease as a sport. Um, so the sport of Parkinson's involves motor and non-motor symptoms that you need to be aware of if you're going to work with that population. So I began, at the time I was doing that research, there really wasn't a lot out there. Now they have the LSVT Big program, they have the Power program, they know the Tai Chi and biking is are very popular. Uh, but I was kind of off of my own and the stuff I found was really boring. So I decided to apply um, my knowledge as a trainer to the sport of Parkinson's and add kind of a sport component to um, to the work, to make it fun and engaging and uh, hopefully meaningful and result-oriented. So the stuff that we do and that I've developed are, are very specific. Um, there's no wasted uh, exercise. Everything is specifically designed to address the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, so I guess after my work with Joe, I began to get known um, – in the medical community as a guy who was working very effectively with his population. So I began to be uh, asked to speak to rehab facilities and eventually I found my way. Uh, I wanted to give back to the community. So I became an advocate for people with Parkinson's and joined a nonprofit. Uh, so I'm president of a nonprofit disease that is um, uh, comprised of all volunteers and we raise money to help people in the Los Angeles area that live with the disease and their family. So that was my way of kind of continuing to work uh, as a volunteer and advocate to the community I was serving. And I really enjoy it. I often say that um, I get back more than I give every day. So it's, uh, it's rewarding work. And like I, I guess when I started this long kind of explanation, how we kind of find ourselves in the position in the work that we do, I owe this all to Joe. Uh, which is kind of funny. It was a miracle that I met him, and just my work with him changed my life. And now I have uh, something I really believe in, and I actually have a lot of fun doing. So that's kind of my 
background as a trainer, how I kind of got into this this work. Um, over the course of time, in order to achieve certain results uh, through my exercise, I've uh, found it necessary to actually develop um, some programs and some products. I've got um, a tool I call the Brain Ball, which is a modified ball oh, yeah. and rope that um, is being used actually all over the world now uh, and by rehab facilities, by individuals and trainers and physical therapists to introduce um, an efficient way to, yes, uh, an efficient way to um, uh, incorporate fine motor, movement initiation, hand-eye coordination seamlessly into your uh, exercise or rehab program. And then I also developed a product that is I use with everyone. It's called the Brain and Body Bar. And that is a, a bar. I wish I had one but uh, to show you. But it's a bar about three feet long. and It's got handles on either side. And you use it to, uh, to do what I call evolutionary movements, movements that we've been performing uh, since we walked around as hunter-gatherers on two feet. Uh, chops, lifts, presses, pushes, pulls, all that stuff. Uh, and it's really great even for the elite athlete because what it does, it really kind of restores the upper body chest as well as um, uh, increase your balance and strength through the different movements that uh, I've created. So, uh, And the fun thing is, now that I'm shooting my own videos, is that I have a much broader um, audience. Um, I've got people all over the world uh, that I'm now corresponding with. And I, I found it really, really neat and fun. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Boy. So Joe was your, your, in, your the first guy, right? He's like your Adam, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Joe was. And I got to tell you, I've worked with probably, well, hundreds for sure, maybe thousands of people with Parkinson's uh, over the years. And probably today he was my toughest customer. He was a pain in the butt. He was really stubborn, and he actually had a form of Parkinson's. There uh, called there's a standard or typical Parkinson's, and there's a group called atypical. And he was one of the atypical forms. Atypical can be uh, a little more cruel and a little bit more harder to work with. And so he had a um, uh, a condition. He had Lewy body, but he also had uh, vascular Parkinson's. That's the reason that his Parkinson's was um, uh, presenting. Uh, it's a condition called vascular Parkinson's. So he had all the things that you would see um, in someone with Parkinson's that are generally known. He had the tremor. Uh, he had stiffness. Um, and he didn't really respond. The atypical group don't really respond, unfortunately, that well to the, the pharmaceutical um, things that they have available. Uh, but, yeah, he was he was stubborn. and uh, uh, But I, I learned so much from the guy, and uh, I miss him. But I think of him every day. Isn't that funny how um – uh, just prepping for your show, I, I read that, and 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 it, it's been my experience that Parkinson's really affects guys quite a bit, um, yeah. a lot more than women. Uh, it seems like for me, it's like almost three to one guys to women. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of your experience too, in terms of exercising? Well, uh, uh, let me think about this. I'll tell you one thing: uh, as we age, women seem to be more proactive than men in, in regards to exercise. Like I teach a couple of senior exercise classes oh, and they're yeah. mostly they're mostly women Lots of women, uh, there yeah. Are men. yeah there are men and um it's interesting i haven't really noticed that huge a difference in the population an interesting thing is they're realizing that you can actually get parkinson's at a much earlier age than they used to think you could it's called a uh, young onset or early onset right. uh disease and you can get it in your 20s actually uh maybe even younger there was um at the world parkinson's conference last year i had some friends that had attended and they said they met someone in their teens that was diagnosed with parkinson's wow. yeah. so it's primarily an older it comes along older but uh to, for older people but there is a larger um acknowledgement and a larger population of people that are getting it younger. Um, and there's always the one of the things that the medical community is really trying to do is determine ways to diagnose it earlier, because the sooner you can intervene with uh, pharmaceutical, with uh, nutritional and with exercise, getting on the same page, those are the three things that you can do to optimize your quality of life. Um, the sooner you can begin that journey and make yourself knowledgeable about, about what's going on, uh, the better. So, Right, absolutely, yeah. So um, in terms of Parkinson's, for people who don't really know Parkinson's, they might have a friend who has Parkinson's, what are the, um, what are the, the telltale signs that you have Parkinson's or, or uh, the, ch the body challenges? I know there's a, there's a lot of body, body challenges in terms of Parkinson's. 
Right. So Parkinson's is uh, due to um, a damaged area of the brain called the substantia nigra, uh, where dopamine is produced. And what happens is the cells and the neurons that begin to produce dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, for some reason begin to die. Uh, we're able to function and not actually present anything Parkinsonian at all until we're depleted down to about 20 percent. Uh, 20 or 30 percent of our dopamine levels and what will typically start to happen is you might the, the symptoms okay so the symptoms occur differently in everyone and they don't progress the same for everyone and there's no right. way to predict it so um, really I hear many different stories uh, my leg was dragging for some reason I didn't know what it was um, I had this little shake in my hand I didn't know what it was um, I felt weak um, those are some of the things that early on begin to drive people to the, the doctors and then the doctors start taking a look and they go through this journey until someone says, you know, I think that what's going on is you have Parkinson's. And that's the one thing that everyone with Parkinson's actually has in common. Um, they might not all have the tremor, but they all have that moment of diagnosis, which is so difficult and so vastly different from from everyone that gets inducted into this crappy club. Um, they all have that moment where someone sits them down and gives them the bad news and it is often delivered compassionately, but sometimes it's delivered very clumsily, uh, depending on who does it. So in terms of the things that we as a population, when we think about Parkinson's, we of course know Michael J. Flox, we have the, we understand that, we know Muhammad Ali, uh, what he's, he looks like. But the trick to Parkinson's, like I said, is it, it really, it's not, it looks different for everyone. And when there's no way to predict what is going to happen next or how fast it's going to occur. So the journey to diagnosis is often a tough one. And then, you know, I, there's a, there's a neurologist out here, you know, in Los Angeles, we're very fortunate to have some really great, uh, neurologists. And there's a, a guy who is the head of uh, neurology over at Cedars Sinai. And he and I were talking and he said, you know, he has worked on his, tell when he sits them down and tells them when they have Parkinson's and what he says is there's good news and there's bad news and he says this is how I tell them I say the bad news is you have Parkinson's and the good news is that's the end of the bad news so <laughs> you know and so he's got a very proactive uh, way of managing the disease and uh, he would uh, he's an example of a guy who um, has really thought about that moment and how to break that news and that's that's really really important because uh, the medical community, we all are so dependent on that. And they're really, from the stories you hear about the journey to diagnosis and the actual letting someone know, it really needs, I think, to be something that people are trained to do. You know, And I'm not so sure that their curriculum includes that too much. Um, so I kind of weaved through what you see to the diagnosis and and and. and some important things for people to know that uh, maybe watching this that have Parkinson's, you can live a life full of love, joy, and happiness, even with the disease. Um, it's different. You've got a pain in the butt big brother now that's going to be messing with you for the rest of your life. But the other good news is that for every time there's a change, there is some sort of strategy, either through exercise, physical therapy, or pharma. Uh, there's something that you can do to try to, to address that. Right, yeah. Uh, I, I still work at a hospital. I still do full-time physical therapy. And um, I'll, I'll often be in a room and uh, I read the patient's chart. You know, it's like I, before I get in a room, I read their chart and look at all their diagnoses. And um, I have to, if Parkinson's is in there, I, I definitely write it down. But a lot of times it's not in there and I'll go in the room and I'll go, boy, <laughs> you know, you're... You, you've got that shuffling gait, uh, you know, you're you're kind of bend over, you're not really responding a lot, you have kind of that flaccid Thanks. look on your face, um, and I, I won't tell the patient, but I'll, if, the, if the spouse is there, a family member, I said, you know, have, have they been checked out for Parkinson's? Uh, you know, I'll just kind of mention it, Yeah. and they'll say, well, no. Um, uh, so I don't really make a diagnosis, but I just suggest... Uh, because the family, they they might not know what Parkinson's looks like. It's just grandpa's getting, you know, he's getting kind of old and he's shuffling. But, uh, you know, for you or me, it's like, you know, there's 
and and it's a uh, ah. it's a diagnosis you have to. Uh, there's no blood test for Parkinson's. It's right. just like it's just like you know it's like you know <laughs> looking at yeah. your looking at that. Yeah. yeah, you're you're exactly right, and that's what makes the diagnosis, especially when the symptoms are subtle, uh, difficult. And I boy, I don't envy your position. Um, when people come to me, they know they have Parkinson's just because of my reputation. But that's it. Sounds like you really handle that that event very very well and uh, compassionately. Uh, no one wants that news, and obviously you're not going to be diagnosing. So um, yeah, that's. You know, the other thing I will just say, um, since we're talking about the, um, the medical community to, that people should be aware of, in Los Angeles, um, we've got a, a, a wonderful medical community, and there's a distinction between neurologists that people should be aware of, and, and that is that if you have a movement disorder or Parkinson's or something like that, you really should have on your medical team what is called a um, movement disorder disorder. Uh, uh, neurologist, fellowship trained in movement disorders. Like a specialist, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they, um, and it's not always possible. Um, I think I saw some survey where 80% of people with Parkinson's are treated by a general practitioner, uh, 15% are by a general neurologist, and only 5% uh, by the neurologist who is fellowship trained in movement disorders. And um, that doesn't mean that they're not being cared for properly, but what it does mean is if you're able to see that fellowship trained movement disorder neurologist, they just have a lot more people with Parkinson's coming through the door each day. Um, and they have more training in that area specifically. So I would encourage everyone to kind of um, understand the distinction. If it's possible, um, you know, have go and see someone. You don't have to leave the neurologist you're with right now. Sometimes people feel very awkward because they have a relationship with their neurologist asking for a referral, uh, but you shouldn't. And uh, really what everyone wants for someone with Parkinson's is to live as optimally and as comfortably as they can. So that means being becoming proactive uh, in the management and care of your disease. So if you're able to, if you live in an area where they have those guys around or gals around, um, check them out and go in and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Do we have a good uh, protocol here? Uh, do you have any suggestions? And usually those neurologists kind of talk back and forth with each other. Uh, it's not as uh, intimidating as one might think. What would be the, yeah, just talking about the symptoms. Um, so you're, 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 uh, you're a 72-year-old woman, and you've noticed your husband, um, uh, you think they might have Parkinson's. What are like one or two signs that you've seen that uh, may suggest a doctor's visit? Um, um, okay. Uh, probably movement related, I imagine. Uh, yeah. So you here, um, the, the, the point you make is really an awesome question for a lot of reasons. There are both motor and non-motor symptoms. Um, the non-motor might be depression, might be a soft voice. Um, sometimes, uh, it's myo myography. I think I can't remember the name of it, but it's a, a small, your handwriting becomes very small. Um, oh, and then, micrography. but the Yes, yes, exactly. Micrography. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I just thought of that. That's actually, I have uh, I have worked with someone that uh, was in the doctor's office, and they were trying to figure out what's going on, and she was asked to write something down, and he looked down, and he said, "Up, oh, you have Parkinson's," and he diagnosed it by the small writing. Wow. Um, yeah. Mm. So, uh, but you know, typically, um, so oh, depression is another one that can um, yeah. present early on. You know, he's getting depressed and his legs shuffling. Um, that might be, you know, leg dragging, problems getting out of a chair. Um, obviously, the tremor is, is, you know, something that might, um, uh, a stooped, uh, somebody started leaning to one side might be an early tell. Um, and also, the other reason that your question was so great is that what people now are realizing more importantly is that Parkinson's not only affects the person with the disease, but the entire family. Right. So a care partner, I call them care partners, not caregivers, um, because really it's a partner with it needs to take care of his or herself as well, because it's difficult. It's difficult growing old together anyway. Um, right. But, um, you really need to, as a family with Parkinson's or a person with Parkinson's or a care partner of someone with Parkinson's, create a strategy to address the disease that affects the individual, but also um, affects the partner. 
uh, or the spouse. So um, it's it's really good to know that and 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 name it and identify it and begin to work on it as a partner and as a person with Parkinson's. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I just. Uh just for an interesting point, so many people have had Park. I just looked at celebrities. I googled celebrities with Parkinson's, and yeah. uh, it's a huge list. Ninety percent male. Um, wow. Michael J. Fox. Well, Janet Reno, but uh, Salvador <laughs> Dali, Pope John Paul II, yeah. Vincent Price, um, Linda Ronstadt, Terry yeah. Thomas, the guy with the gap tooth in England, the actor. Pierre Trudeau, George Wallace, Adolf Hitler, Billy Graham, Robin Williams, um, a lot of guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, it would probably be it would probably be uh, your your wife or somebody might notice it. Uh, yeah, you know that. Uh, and um, you know, they their estimates are anywhere in the United States. People with Parkinson's, one point five to two million people have it including the diagnosed and obviously the ones that are yet to be diagnosed. I personally feel it's probably larger than that. They say that new cases are diagnosed uh, in the amount of 50,000 a year. So if you do the math on that, um, in 10 years, you've added another 500,000 really, I think. So um, I, I think it's a lot more common than, um, than we think, um, unfortunately. But it, uh, there is no national registry, which makes it difficult as well of Parkinson's. So there's still a lot that could be done. And, you know, people are working very hard to find the disease, but also uh, find the solutions that uh, improve the quality of life and either slow the progression or pause the progression. And so, you know, I've heard some really wonderful researchers talk. And the first question they get is, when are we going to find a cure? And they what i generally hear is that um they don't know and there's no way to tell when that's going to come but the good news is they think that within three years to five years they will come up with some sort of solution that either drastically shows slows it or pauses it or possibly pauses it and then uh reverses it so uh if you have parkinson's and you're watching this um take heart that there's a lot of work being done to find ways to make your life better. There are new, there's new stuff in the queue right now. Uh, there's stuff that comes out every year um, <clears throat> that are uh, ways to uh, either preserve or uh, encourage the dopamine produ production. So, um, with a strategy that involves, um, okay, so if you have Parkinson's, you really have three things you should maintain. One is your nutrition. Um, two is an exercise program, and then three is your um, your doctors, uh, your medical team. So those are the three things that you can do to optimize your life. And they're really discovering that proper exercise is hugely beneficial and also makes the meds that you might be taking more effective. Um, so those are the th three things that you can do as someone with Parkinson's to focus on identify name and 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 work on um, there are tons of sources for exercise now on online um, and now that we've talked about online one other thing i will just say is if you have parkinson's beware your red meat um, there are there are people out there online that promise teas promise cures all this stuff and even and, and seniors know this as well i mean they're constantly um, in danger of somebody coming up, calling up and selling them something that's, and, and I hear it all the time. Um, so be careful of the supplements that, uh, you look into. Most of them are benign, but check it out with your doctor before you start taking something or buying something. If somebody calls you over the phone and starts selling you something, hang that phone up. Hang it up, right? <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's rarely anything. And I, I spoke with this woman in the Midwest. Uh, I felt so bad. She had just bought some sort of um, supplement that cost her $600 for a year supply. That was um, uh, some sort of stem cell nonsense. Wow. Um, hmm. Yeah, some sort of thing that was going to. Yeah, and not that stem cells are nonsense, but the supplement was using some sort of made some sort of unsubstantiated claim that it was going to reverse the aging process. So uh, that's the other thing you got to be so careful uh, about um, 
especially if you're going online, who you are um, uh, spending your time with reading or corresponding with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we have we have uh, our our seventy two year old uh, spouse, and right. she she discovers that her her husband has Parkinson's. They take him to the doctor, and they put him on Cinnamon or whatever the the uh, medication is, and then usually they just go home. Right? It's just like come back in two weeks. So what what would you what would your advice be for for uh, someone who just recently or you know within the past year um, has a, a family member with Parkinson's uh, in terms of your your especially exercise what what should they what should they do in addition to the medication um, they're just sitting at home right now watching this video uh, um, oh I never okay. knew it <laughs> okay so let, I probably should have prefaced this just um, uh, so I am a personal trainer and a strengthening and conditioning specialist I'm not a medical professional um, but I share some of the things I see. Um, but uh, anything that you see here uh, or hear here from me, uh, your, what your doctor says it goes first. Um, so, um, so if you're someone who is a care partner and you're looking for some sort of orientation, what I would do is find out, first of all, there are what they call support groups for both the person with Parkinson and care partners, depending on what year, area you're in. Now, support groups are not great for everyone, um, but if you feel like a uh, be, being with other people in that community that have the same situation, I would go online and go to some of the main uh, larger nonprofits, uh, the NPS, the, the APDAs, the, the PDFs, these are all um, Parkinson's Disease Foundation um, is a great one, and see if they have any local resources, um, and, and and get uh, yourself uh, acquainted with uh, the people in your area that work with the disease. Classes, exercise classes, are a great way to meet people uh, that are in the same boat. Uh, I have uh, I teach a couple of senior exercise classes, but because of my reputation, I get a lot of people with Parkinson's coming to them, and I get a lot of uh, Parkinson's and their spouse uh, showing up, and that's a great way to to kind of uh, continue to integ integrate into the community. Um, the biggest piece of advice is um, I could say is don't turn in word and and make sure you get out and meet people. Um, don't close down uh, because it it's not a death sentence, and uh, there are many ways, like I said, to to live happily and and uh fulfilling um the nonprofit that we um created here in los angeles does an art show every year and we rent an art gallery and take out all the art and restock it with art for people with parkinson's and it's amazing wow and it's it's an incredible event yeah That's great so yeah so uh get up out of your chair and, and and pick up the phone or get online and find some resources uh, you, you'll be better for it. You'll feel stronger. You'll feel like you got friends out there that are doing, dealing with the same stuff that you're dealing with. Yeah. What are two, um, so you, so you're at home, what, what, um, is there something easy they could do at home, um, other than a, 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 a an official exercise class, something they could do at home to practice, um, uh, balance or, um, uh, uh, just try to become better at movement in their house. Uh, do you have any yeah. exercise tips that they could do at home with, you know, relatively no equipment? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, great question. Um, I guess I'll just tell you, I've got a couple of DVD products and some stuff available online. I've got uh, the one that comes to mind as you're describing, I've got a, a five minute Parkinson's workout, which is a series of 10 five minute workouts. Um, the thing, yes. So, Here's the deal. If you have Parkinson's, uh, you're obviously going to want to work on balance. You're going to work on your posture, your strength, your movement. But all of that is basically under the umbrella of function. What we're trying to do uh, as someone living with Parkinson's and even as we age in general, what we're trying to do is preserve, maintain, or improve our function. So in terms of exercises at home um, – there's some stuff. I also have a YouTube channel that's got tons of videos online, uh, exercises that are free and available. Um, I've got yeah. some uh, 
I've got we'll, some. Pardon me. We'll link all that up at the end. But okay, that's a good. Great, yeah, great. I'll put that all at the end of the video. Yeah. So I've got um, tons. I also have stuff for the PT or trainer that kind of gives you an, an umbrella approach uh, to um, what my approach is. As you can see, I've got a, a big banner here behind me. Yeah, you can see Smart XPD is my brand, and it stands for Strength, Mobility, Agility, Reaction, and Technique. Spells smart um oh, nice i like that <laughs> yeah so uh there are those are kind of some of the pillars of what i i use um so in terms of what you can do at home um anything that you do um should be something that in the end will likely improve your function getting up and down out of a chair is a perfect example or getting up the stairs we want to be able to continue to do that right um yeah, so, um, by the way, Dallas, I, I have a kind of unique thing that I, I came up with that I, I don't want to forget. Uh, it's a vocal Please. cue thing. We're making, uh, it's kind of, you know what, I'll, I'll just go into it now since it's kind of related. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, got, we got time. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So this is funny. What I've discovered, in addition to the fact that certain exercises really help and certain exercises are a waste of time, is that once you open up, you start understanding the disease and you start thinking outside of the box, the whole world opens up in front of you. And you try stuff that is really weird and doesn't work and you try stuff that all of a sudden surprisingly does work. I developed an accessory for a walker, for instance, that has a light uh, cue for each limb and it goes on the walker and it lights up wow. and when you do a successful gait, it chimes, that light shuts off and then this one pops on and it like eliminates freezing. Um, wow. and so we've got that. We're trying to bring that to market um, and do some validation studies and that sort of thing. But um, that's an example of something that I came up with, actually with Joe, my first client, um, that was surprisingly effective at uh, improving gait. I would take a piece of exercise tubing, I'd string it across the, the front legs of the walker, and it gives him a visual cue and a tactile cue because he can sort of feel his shin hit it. So um, that was the, the beginning of it. And then I put two balls on it, and then that was helpful too. And then I decided to put the light and sound to it. Um, but the funny thing is, and this is going to sound really weird, uh, I was working with a client of mine, Leonard, the other day, and he has freezing. He has freezing gait, and he has some problems walking. And we were talking, and I said, well, how was your weekend? He said, oh, it's a great weekend. My wife and I went to the, uh, the Ronald Reagan uh, Center, and it was just a, it was a beautiful day. And he said that, and the way he said it, he just brightened up. He said, it's a beautiful day. And I said, all right, Leonard, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We were at the gym, and his caregiver was there. Um, and we're sitting there, and I'm like, oh, what I want you to do is I'm going to stop, stop right here, take a breath, and I want you to say, it's a beautiful day, and then walk. So he said, it's a beautiful day, and he just started walking. And by saying it's a beautiful day, and I don't know what happens there. Maybe the brain gets distracted. It distracted him, right, yeah. Yeah, or, or the affirmation of it was a beautiful day. And so we started playing with it. It was really effective. And I swear, Douglas, this is the honest to God truth. We're sitting there, and three minutes into it, they have music at the gym. It starts playing It's a Beautiful Day by U2. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, I look at the caregiver, and I'm like, do you hear that? And he kind of shakes his head, and we both look. I look at my arm, and I have goosebumps. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to consider that a sign. I'm using it's a beautiful day. So I use it with Leonard. I start using it with uh, other folks. And for whatever reason, some sort of um, maybe changing of tasks, uh, not focusing on the freeze, vocalizing. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the words, it's a beautiful day. Uh, but it released him from his freeze, and we're using it all the time now. Getting up from the chair um i've got another verbal cue i i use with him and i i was just thinking we were going to try this he has a real hard time getting out of the chair i said leonard if you were sitting in a barn and the barn was on fire what would you do he'd say he said i uh, get the heck out of there i said yes you would i want you to say the barn is burning and get out of the chair and so he says the barn is burning and he steps up and gets out of the chair wow i don't know so i just kind of stumbled upon this vocalization this uh, technique uh, within the last year, um, but I guess if you're watching it, try either of those, and you know, let Douglas know if any if it works for you. Yeah, now, I'm not the comments promise, below. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm not going to promise it works. Here's the one thing that you also need to know, uh, as someone with Parkinson's uh, in all areas, is that you have responders and non-responders to techniques to meds, uh, which makes it so. Uh, it's kind of uh, an art 
uh, for these doctors to kind of uh, put together the right compilation of stuff to optimize the way you're functioning. Uh, same thing with exercise. Um, I will work with someone that presents a certain way and come up with a technique that is great and someone will come in right after them presenting the same way and it won't work. So um, same thing uh, you know, with uh, supplements. Some people really uh, swear by certain supplements they're taking and I, I never say don't do it just because uh, there is the placebo effect that uh, right. it works as well, you know. So, I had a, a client that was on a, a multi-level. Um, it, it was a supplement you can only get by becoming a um, a distributor. You know, it's it's. I think it's nonsense, but he swore by it. I just I just said talk to your doctor about it. I didn't tell him it was a waste of time or money because he thinks it was working. Right. And you know what? That's sometimes all it takes. And the placebo effect won't work forever, but it'll work for some time. It's something that is validated and recognized in the scientific community as a real, real factor. So right, you gotta have, have a, a lot. you have to have a lot of tools in your toolbox, right? You do, you do, and it takes a lot of experience, and that's why. So I guess if you're looking for someone to work with, um, either a trainer or PT, make sure that they've done it before, because pretty much. Either of those guys or gals will take you, but you want to make sure that they have uh, ex experience um, beyond their tra tra traditional um, education and training. There's a lot of uh, extra uh, programs that uh, people can take. The LSVT Big uh, for the physical therapist, the Power Program, is by a woman named uh, a PT uh, named Becky Farley out of Arizona, and that's a very good program. Yes. Yeah, she's great. Look them up. They're um, they're they're uh, one of the more diverse um, uh, approaches. They have classes and they have seminars that you can that aren't cheap, but you can go out and spend a, I guess maybe I think it's a ten day program with them or something. But wow. yeah, so just um, I guess my advice would be you know if you oh here's the other thing is you can often get a prescription for physical therapy from your doctor if you have stuff going on, either balance or strength. So that's a, a way to, to get your insurance to help pay for some of this. Uh, right. But once you get that script, yeah, once you get that script, make sure you get a referral that your doctor trusts. And if they don't know, call around or look online and, and find someone that uh, is either certified in those or has um, you know extensive experience working with it. And you'll be able to tell in the first session whether or not the person knows what they're doing. So Yeah, definitely give the the therapy clinic a call and say, do you have any, you know, neurological uh, specialists? Because there, there is a, uh, I'm a geriatric specialist, but there is a neurological specialist, yeah. physical therapy. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can definitely find some of those, um, which is really good. So I'm going to use your idea about the, the speaking up uh, to yeah. get people out of a chair because uh, li literally, um, you know, sometimes I'm in a room and, and, the patient will have Parkinson's, but they're here because they broke their hip or something like that, which really combines, you know, oh. the the, the, tragedy, the tragedy, and uh, uh, it literally can only take 20 minutes to walk 10 feet, and I'm sure you know about that. You know, they they're freezing, uh, you know, plus they got an injured hip, um, so I'll, I'll see if I can use that. Uh, the vocalization. The vocalization. Yeah. The other thing I uh, always have in my pocket when I have someone with Parkinson's that has that issue is a laser pointer. Um, and that, I, I don't know why, but any type of visual cue will help someone move quicker, larger amplitude, reach higher, step faster, step further. And what I'll do is I'll just point a, a little, little red dot on the floor. I'll say step on the dot and bam, they just break it and step right over it. So that's another thing. If you have freezing, uh, there are techniques named techniques uh, that you can practice to break that quicker. Um, so usually when I have someone with um, uh, Parkinson's that freezes and they all the techniques don't universally work. Some will work for some, not for others. But the first thing we do is we stop and we breathe. And we don't try to move if we're frozen. We recenter our balance so it's weight evenly dis uh, distributed and then I have them just weight shift back and forth and then when they're ready, step out. We can vocalize and step out. We can look down and see a crack in the floor to step across. Um, so when you have these symptoms that crop up, um, find someone like yourself, Douglas, or a trainer uh, that 
has ideas of how to name that symptom and work on a strategy to to improve it and then practice it the same way uh, every time. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. freezing is 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 uh, and, and gait is uh, those are two real problematic. Um, symptom issues but they're also trainable issues you can you can work on them and, and get some improvement right yeah it, it's funny i've noticed um, through the years that and i've heard this from other therapists that uh, parkinson's people freeze a lot when they go through thresholds huh. yeah. and I, I i heard that from a therapist so i said well let me try it and it, it kind of is true a- anecdotally um because uh, uh, in the hospital there's a lot of doors so I'm mm-hmm. usually getting people outside the room, trying to assess their gait out in the hallway. And uh, they get to the door, and it's just, it's, it's interesting that they just kind of freeze. So yeah. probably getting a little laser pointer and, you know, instead of your cat to say, hey, follow that laser pointer. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is, you're, the doorway is a big one. Um, that's the first one I notice when I first started doing the work is the doorway. And the other thing to realize is that, um, okay, sleep hygiene, incredibly important. You need eight hours of sleep. If you don't get it, you'll find your symptoms probably are worse on the following day. And the other thing that really exacerbates the symptoms is stress. Any type of stress, like uh, navigating a curb or um, going through a doorway, it's just some, for some reason, it stresses people out. Um, so, you know, being aware of that and, and having a technique, if, you, if doorways are going to freeze you, have a technique to start working on. Look past the door. Look at the threshold and step over it. Um, if you have a, a distance that you're traveling, try to do it in as few paces safely as, as few paces as you can. You know, if you think it's going to take you 10 steps, try to do it in eight as you walk through the door. Um, so uh, there are there are workarounds that you, you know, Douglas. I'm sure you've seen. Um, it, it's it's pretty. I hate the disease, um, but it's a puzzle, and it responds to the proper stimulus. Um, so in that way, I'm I'm always fascinated by it, and and, and continually um, surprised at the differences that you can make. Um, uh, in improving the way people move and the way they feel in their health. So Right, yeah. Well, it, it, just talking to you here, like you have such a specialty, you have such a, a focus with the Parkinson's and exercise that you're coming up with these you know, little lights that you put on your feet and stuff like, which I, well, I don't do. I don't have time to do that. You know, I'm like, you know, I've got five other patients to see. So you have the time and the, the specialty and the awareness so your brain is, I can just see your brain, the way, you, the way you're talking to me, I can just see your brain working. What else can I do to get that patient walking a little faster or a little better? Um, so you're coming up with all these little cute little ideas, which is, which as therapists, we don't have time to really do it unless we're, you know, we, we're working. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we, yeah. So I, that's, that's one thing I like about being a, doing what I do is that um, I do have the ability to experiment and try things and fail and try things and succeed. I think if you looked in my trunk, uh, you'd be, uh, you might have a chuckle at the things you see in there. You might find a canoe paddle. <laughs> you'd certainly find wiffle balls. Uh, you'd find some unconventional things that uh, I use to, to, um, to, uh, to, to achieve what I want to achieve. You know, I, like I, I talked earlier about evolutionary movements and movements that, um, Harken to things that we did in our youth, like like the canoe paddle is a perfect example. I use that often. Actually, I haven't used it uh, over the last year, but yes. But what happens is, side, you know, the other side. Yeah, we're, we're paddling, and all of a sudden we remember uh, a canoe trip that we had with our family that was so enjoyable. And, th- and these moments come back. Um, you know, people talk about muscle memory and, and how it can exercise can be a very emotional and cathartic uh, experience. And yeah, so anytime, you know, we're going to go on a canoe trip. Do you ever canoe with your family? Oh, yeah, you know, we went up the river, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, they're taken into this place that they weren't in um, before they walked through the door, you know, and they have a, they're, they're reliving a little memory that was enjoyable. So anytime I can uh, relate movement to uh, evolutionary movements or, or, or patterns that we have performed as, as a small child or growing up, I, I often do. You know, Parkinson's 
oftentimes makes the things we learned to do without being taught difficult. Getting out of the chair. We never had a walking lesson, right? But we, we crawled in reciprocal pattern. We, and then we evolved into the natural swing of the arms. But with Parkinson's, that's a perfect example, gait, um, it can cause stiffness in the arms. So we have to then learn to walk by making the upper body active and keeping the flow in the reciprocal movement. And that's that reciprocal pattern that we do naturally is tough on the brain. The brain always wants to take the easy way out and wants to do this leg and this arm, you know. It uh, doesn't want to coordinate the two back and forth you can't see my knees but anyway um yeah so that's the other thing is that we have to with parkinson's break down the things we learn to do without getting being taught and figure out how to do them rolling over in the bed getting out of the chair walking going upstairs uh so you got to have a, a system and a strategy for these events and these adls your activities of daily living right right talk a bit uh you, you just triggered me uh for uh an exercise um uh, you talked about symmetrical gait. Can you explain that? Because that seems like a really big component of, of, um, of Parkinson's is losing your ability to walk, to walk yeah. naturally. So explain to our people what symmetrical gait means. Well, so gait and symmetrical. Yeah, yeah, reciprocal movement. Basically, one arm is going forward and the opposite leg is going forward. Um, reciprical, yeah, I said symmetrical. Yeah, but. yeah it's, 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 but it's symmetrical. It, 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 that makes sense, too. Um, so, yeah, so training the arms. The arms, basically, the swing of the arm pre uh, uh, presents uh, centrifugal leverage for the hip. And we, as walking is a series of single leg mo balance moments. And it's a flow and a moving. And the swing of the arms, I mean, you could certainly walk without swinging your arms. You can walk, but stiffly. Um, but the swing of the arm is, is not only better for your balance, it's better for the shoulder. The, uh, the, it will reduce stiffness if you try to make sure you're swinging your arms. And it, it requires practice. Um, uh, I oftentimes have the person like hold um, a bar in each hand and I'll walk behind them and manufacture the reciprocal movement and make it very big. So they're walking and we're swinging and then I'll have them let go and just kind of let the arms um, swing and throw. I tell people with their arms, it's it's a swing and it's a throw, a throw back and a swing forward. Mm. And if they think about that, it, it loosens it uh, loosens the way the move the limbs move. Because when you swing and you throw, there's really no tightness. Because um, we throw balls, we understand if you tighten up, that ball's not going very far. I'll show you one thing that occurs to me um, that I came up with really interesting. That's an example. Please this is not so me. much. I'm excited. I'm excited. I love all the stuff you're doing. I just see your brain going around. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I got, I got to put a video. I put, I have two, two baby girls, two and a half right now today. Um, and I've been watching them develop and I've got so much great ideas from just watching them. And Kate, I, she's like a hoarder. She'll walk around the, 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 um, the house with like two teddy bears, a blanket, and she carries as much as she can. And I was watching her and what she would do is she can't hold stuff in her hands She'd hold stuff here, and then she'd put something under her arm, and she'd walk around, carry all this stuff. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. She's got something under her arm. I've done that just today with my mail. So I started doing this um, with my people who are in wheelchairs or have upper body weakness. And what I do is I take a towel and just like this, and I'll have them seated or whatever, and I'll take it, and I'll tuck it under their arm. And I'll say, squeeze that as hard as you can. And what I'll do is as they're squeezing it, I'll tell them to tighten their abs and tighten their arms. And what happens is when I tug it, they can feel it slipping and they recruit like twice as much musculature as, in, as, in, in addition to what they're just doing. I say, if you just squeeze it, I'm going to get some activation. But if I start tugging it, all of a sudden it's recruiting core, arm, everything. It's like that's an example of one of these cues that you can use that really increase like I'll do it with on both sides too. As they're walking, I'll tug it. Really increase the the motor recruitment. And sometimes if someone's in a chair, it's really it's difficult to do work on core, but it's important still. And this is at, you can pull it across as well out or backwards. It's either. fun. <laughs> you, you can do it backwards, right? You could tug it from behind as well. Um, so, but it's a it's just a a, a, a little trick that uh, makes the exercise more effective, recruits more muscles. And those little things I find incredibly interesting. Um, another 
quick example, um, you're making me think of it, you've got the headphones in, um, Quiet Voice, I've got a video up on YouTube, and that's my client Leonard, uh, he, uh, soft voice is a symptom that can occur with people with Parkinson's, so I had this idea, uh, I put in earphones in them and played the Gap Band, and what happens <laughs> is it reduces their ability to hear their voice, and immediately he's talking twice as loud, louder than he ever talked, because he needs that, it's called... Um, uh, audio. I thought Feedback I discovered or something, huh? It's it is uh, audio. Um, oh gosh, they're they're working on it now. I thought I had vent and discovered something. Um, and I, I, it's uh, but anyway, it's it's suppressing the individual's ability to hear the voice, and it prompts them to automatically um, to speak like loud. their level, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it increases the volume. So, um, um, oh, it's driving me nuts. I know this. I just can't. Well, whatever. One of those scientific uh, words. Huh? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, it'll come to me as we talk about something else. Right. But yeah, so th there are those tricks um, that you can do um, perturbation to kind of, you know, increase shoulder recruitment by just doing unpredictable movements and have the person leave their fist, not move it from that position. That's a, a kind of a, a textbook example of, of ways they, it's called, that's called perturbation, uh, that they um increase stabilization of the joints and can trick the body into giving you some more um, motor activation. Right. Um, I, I saw, uh, just Googling some stuff this morning, uh, uh, dance is really important. Yeah. So there's like some dance clubs for Parkinson's. So what's, yeah. do you know anything about that? What's that all about? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's uh, dance classes. People love it. Um, there's a, a group out here called Invertigo Dance uh, that has a program. Oh, my cat's jumping around here. Uh, but yeah, dancing is something that um, it's social, it's interactive, it's therapeutic. Um, you know, basically what you're trying to do, uh, the mind-body connection, is have a pattern of movement that's enjoyable, safe, and effective, and uh, attempt to accomplish it. And, you know, dancing and moving and getting creative with it, uh, putting your body through patterns you wouldn't normally do uh, through the day is uh, really effective. At, um, at and, and people really like it. You know, dancing is, you know, here's the other thing. I tend to, exercise is a word that people talk about all the time, um, but it's intimidating for so many people. Uh, dancing is not intimidating. Some people may Sounds not like fun. it. Sounds <laughs> fun. Sounds fun, exactly. So what sometimes I will do is if I have someone um, resistant to uh, exercises, I'll say, let's just do some therapeutic movement. So I replace ther exercise with therapeutic movement. So we start doing some things, and then before you know it, I sneak them into a little bit of exercise. So um, for those of you that are intimidated by the word workout or exercise, swap in therapeutic movement doesn't seem near as intimidating. And you don't have to be drenched in sweat running on a treadmill to, make a, to have exercise help and make a difference in your quality of life and your function. So, um, yeah, so... Yeah, what, what would you think, uh, just speaking about exercise, uh, um, like during a typical week, um, you know, we have uh, our gal with the husband with Parkinson's, should he do it once a week or twice a week or, or more? Um, what's your frequency with your, as a personal trainer, um, where, do, where do you get the best benefits in terms of the frequency? Well, um so I basically tell my people they need to be doing something every day for part of the day. It doesn't have to be a three hour workout. It could be 20 minutes and not overly intensive every day. But I would say you could have a pretty intense workout. If you want to see a change in a result, you need to do three to five days of pretty intense workouts. Uh, at least that's in my experience and typically what you'll see, uh, what people recommend. Um, and so anywhere from 30 minutes to 50 minutes would be a, a decent time. And then you want to also, you know, spend some time uh, throughout the week doing some stretching, uh, some floor stuff, you know, that you can do on the floor to, to open up the body. Laying on the floor just on your back is a great thing for someone who has Parkinson's and they have posture stretching, issues. Stretching, right, yeah. Stretching, flexibility. Yeah, so for exercise, um, you have a couple things. One is your uh, cardiovascular that you want to maintain, uh, your strength uh, and flexibility is the other, and then the third uh category I would put is um, uh, technique based or skill based exercise where you're doing stuff that uh, coordination involves, stuff yeah coordination some sort of skill set uh, tossing a ball from one or from one side to the other you know sometimes I'll 
this is a little thing for my glasses, but uh, if I'm walking, going on a power walk, take a water bottle and stop for a minute and just toss it a couple times back and forth, catching it, uh, and then continue your walk. That's an example of something uh, that you could integrate into your, if you have power walking. Walking is a great form of exercise. Biking, for some reason, the, uh, the centrifugal or the, uh, the rotary action of it, they've, they're studying now because it um, intensive exercise, they're called it forced exercise, uh, can help reduce uh, the symptoms um, for the rest of the day and actually ongoing. They are uh, discovering that um, uh, forced exercise or uh, high intensity exercise um, has a, a resonating effect that <clears throat> reduces the symptoms um, after the workout is done. Right. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I usually try to tell people, I said, Parkinson's generally is a progressive, uh, you know, neurological problem. So uh, I, I tell them, look at it like every year is a new year. You know, yeah. every time Christmas comes around, you're a different person because you're, you're, you're not the same. So you have to have different strategies, as you say, uh, you know, to kind of attack your and the the problem uh, with the movement disorder, which is the biggest problem, uh, right? So you, you kind of have to keep evolving, really. So as the spouse of somebody with Parkinson's, you just have to have that in your head that uh, uh, he's not the same as you know. Uh, Bill is not the same as he was last year. He's a little different. He's a little more stooped over. It's a little harder to take those steps. Things like that. Um, yeah. uh, it's good. Good to to look at yeah yeah it's good to be aware of and the other thing to be aware of though uh is you it's not a steady progression most of the time and sometimes you'll get into a tough patch uh that you'll come out of like you're having a real hard time walking it doesn't mean that once that change occurs it stays i've seen people have a tough patch of, uh, they have a week where they just have not slept and their posture falls apart their posture mm -hmm. and um so um the thing to take heart in is if things get tough, doesn't mean they're going to stay that way. Oftentimes it gets tough and then it comes back and you kind of bounce back and forth. But yes, it is a degenerative disease uh, and it does progress, but there's no, many times it's a very slow uh, progressing disease. Sometimes it's fast, which is difficult, uh, yeah. but most of the time it's, it's, it's slow. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Well, great. Uh, so we have like a minute or two left. So um, uh, just to wrap things up, um, where can people find you? You're in LA. Um, yeah. uh, I was just there last week, a little, little tour, a little Hollywood tour. That's uh, kind of fun. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, where can people find you on the internet? Where can they, uh, learn about your products? looks like you have some products, uh, yeah. specifically for Parkinson's, which is really cool. I really like that. Um, yeah. as I say, I just see your brain kind of working. So I think a, a resource like you, uh, even better than a therapist because a therapist, you know, you come in, we, we do your exercises, but, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, having somebody who thinks about it, thinks about the person, uh, individually, what they're doing, I think is really great. So I think you're, you know, you're, you're really spot on in terms of that. So where can people contact you? And I'll put the information below too. Yeah. So my website, uh, website is smartxpd.com. Um, you can also get there by going to patricklasasso.com. Uh, but, and I've also got a, um, a Facebook page called, um, Parkinson's fitness and smart XPD, which Douglas, I'm sure will put up there and you can reach me through Facebook. Um, but you can contact me. I have a contact form on my webpage and I have about seven, uh, DVD programs. I've got a shadow boxing program for Parkinson's. I've got the five minute workout. I have the brain ball program, the bar, and I'm actually just about to release a rise and shine, uh, morning blast workout, which is a, is a series of five, 10 minute workouts that you perform in bed with a wiffle ball before you get out of bed in the morning. Oh, you are busy. <laughs> yeah. And two yeah. girls. Oh my God. Yeah, goodness. I know. <laughs> I know. Yes, it's. But uh, like I say, I, I get so much out of it, and I love the community, and um, I uh, I get much more than I give. And uh, and if you have questions, you have Parkinson's, you want to talk. Uh, you know, my business model is I drive around from home to home to gym to gym. So I got a lot of time where I'm sitting there um, in the car listening to the news, and I don't like to listen to the news. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, just let me know you want to talk, and we'll we'll get on the phone and we'll we'll chat. In L.A., care. you probably spend a lot of time in L.A. in a car in L.A. Right? That's just it yes, is it a is. slow place. 
Uh, that's great. Well, it's been great to talk to you. I really appreciate taking the time to come on here. I think we learned a lot. I think there's a lot. It gave a lot of take-home stuff for um, yeah. all the listeners on uh, Senior Fitness Radio and Elder Gym. So I really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with that. Hopefully, if I my next trip to LA, we'll see if we can meet up and you can show me some of your your cool stuff. I'd love that. That would be great. All right. All right. So, well, thank you so much for inviting me on. Uh, you're doing some great stuff, and uh, the world's a better place because of the work you're doing. So, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right.